This is a Land Rover Defender 90, the short wheelbase model. Also, this one in particular is a bit special as it's the 75th anniversary model. What does this color mean for Land Rover and why is there my many countrymen lurking in the background? Watch this to find out. The Defender is the successor to the Land Rover Series 1, 2 and 3. The Land Rover 1 Series went into production shortly after World War II. It was modeled after the Jeep, but the emphasis in design was on the needs of the farmers. The kind of tractor you could also drive to town. Land Rover also proved to be a useful companion wherever the British ventured. It is said that the Land Rover 1 Series was the first car seen by more than half of the people in developing countries. After 35 years of perfecting the original design, Land Rover launched the Defender, a luxury model by the 3 Series standards, which helped the brand compete with the Japanese off-roaders which were gaining popularity at the time. The Defender survived 36 years in almost unchanged form. I wouldn't be surprised if a new generation was planned for the brand's 70th anniversary, but some delays probably ensued and also overpriced anniversary special editions of the old Defender could still be sold, until suddenly, because of course no one noticed the concept model shown almost a decade ago, a new Defender appeared. Did you notice the color of Land Rovers in some of the historical photos? Does it look familiar? In Land Rover speak, this paint color is now called Grasmere Green. Grasmere is a picturesque village in northwest of England. William Wordsworth lived in Grasmere for 14 years and he called it the loveliest spot that men have ever found. The first Land Rover Series 1 cars rolled out of the factory in this very color, which back then was simply called light green. However, for 2015 Defender Heritage Edition, what was once military surplus light green was promoted to Grasmere Green. And so for the brand's 75th anniversary, instead of brainstorming Land Rover marketing department, just decided that Grasmere Green would be adequate for the occasion, called it a day and went to the pub. So, you can tell the limited edition by the color, body and rims, the 75 years emblems on the boot door and the sides of the dashboard, as well as the green finish of the dashboard components. Also, the limited edition is based on the HSE trim, from which it is some 20,000 euro more expensive, but don't worry about half of that is equipment that is optional on the HSC and a very expensive standard on the limited edition. I recall configuring a Defender 90 in 2021 for myself and whichever way I looked at it, it came out to be around 70,000 euro. Today it would probably be closer to 80 grand, so in that sense, Land Rover prices don't surprise me. At this stage, Anna and I were still thinking that all in all, plaster from the walls could also be a good source of nourishment, especially since we were fresh after a minor home renovation. But then something happened that swayed me towards a countryman. But enough foreshadowing, let's go for a drive and this time I'll try not to get the Defender stuck. My first encounter with the new Defender outside a car show ended with me immediately getting stuck. Watch my adventures with the Defender 110, link on the screen and in the video description. By the way, what do the numbers 90, 110 and 130 signify? The original Defender came in three wheelbase lengths. Initially it was 90 and 110 inches and then a 127 inch wheelbase version was developed for the army and rescue services but since 127 didn't roll off the tongue it was renamed 130. Of course the wheelbase remained unchanged. 
Today the 90, 110 and 130 are just general indication of the model size. 90 is the short wheelbase defender with 259 centimeters wheelbase. The 110 is the standard defender with a 302 centimeters wheelbase and the 130 is the long body defender with 30 centimeters longer body than the 110 because the wheelbase on the 110 and 130 is the same. Let's start with my usual diagonal approach test. I stop halfway so that two wheels on the opposite sides have limited traction. Then I try to get going again and as expected the Defender, even in automatic mode, had no issues. In general, the Land Rover Defender is a very capable off-roader, even in automatic mode. For example, I drove the Defender 110 up this sandy hill without a problem. Only the Jeep Wrangler managed to do the same. My countryman didn't even get up halfway and that's on all-terrain tires. Encouraged by the ease with which the Defender copes off-road, I then drove close to the water failed to check the terrain and got stuck for good. This time I decided not to overdo it and I found a bit of sandy slope, which my countryman is unlikely to go up either, but I promised to give it a try one day, and the defender didn't even break a sweat. By the way, this is Anna behind the wheel, I'm flying the drone. Anna doesn't like driving off-road and claims she can't drive off-road, I get her, she doesn't have a good feel for cars on loose surfaces. That's fine. For example, here you can see that she turned the wheels too much and had to back out. While I was behind the wheel, the car was going uphill at a steady pace. Maybe once I had to delicately add gas, but the sand mode did an excellent job of transferring power to those wheels that happened to have the most grip. By the way, this test car is on winter tires, though as standard it comes on all terrains. The Defender coped better than I did with the drone. It's a pity JLR didn't order an optional ladder, but as you can see, we all got back home safely. And no, I wasn't standing on the roof, I kept my feet on the rails. Let's get back on tarmac. This test car is a P400, which means a petrol inline six with 400 horsepower. This is one of the less fuel-efficient engines in the JLR range. I recently tested an F-Pace with the same engine. Real-world performance and fuel economy were not what the manufacturer promises. And that's despite the mild hybrid. Claimed fuel economy is 11 liters per 100 kilometers combined, and you're never gonna get it. Like in that En Vogue song, I was averaging 15 liters per 100 kilometers, even taking into account the off-road and acceleration tests, it's still a lot, because rest of the time I drove mostly extra urban. Speaking of acceleration, like the F-Pace, the Defender is also half a second slower to 100 kilometers per hour than the manufacturer claims. Instead of 6 seconds, I achieved 6.5 seconds. But with the Defender having the aerodynamic properties of a pile of bricks and steering like a cruise ship, the delivery is much more exciting than in the F-Pace. At the end of the day, the Defender is a true off-roader and that's the driving experience you should expect from it. The Defender drives and handles um, maturely, stately, so plan maneuvers well in advance. Up to 120-130 km per hour, the cabin is relatively quiet, any faster and the wind noise becomes noticeable, obviously. Uh, also, fuel consumption rises above 18 liters per 100 km. This really isn't JLR's most efficient engine. Fortunately, there are diesels, all of them are cheaper. The diesel will also do a better job of towing, even though Defender can tow up to 3 tons regardless of the engine. This one has an electric folding hitch with a weight limit of 150 kilograms. 
Visibility is okay for me, even without the clear side virtual mirror, which happens to be unavailable on the special edition, even as an option. Meanwhile, rear visibility is a problem for Anna. I'm 175 centimeters tall, while Anna is 160 centimeters, so her mirror is set at a different angle and she sees more of the spare wheel in it meaning more cars disappear from her field of vision, uh, practically everything that is not at least a crossover. A 360 camera helps with maneuvering, but don't rely on it while driving. The driving position is comfortable and we both find good settings, no problem. The electrically operated seats with memory function come in handy. I remember that in our configuration we wanted to skip those, but the salesman rightly pushed us to choose this option. An electrically adjustable steering wheel would also be useful. For some reason, on the special edition, this is an option, but standard on regular HSC. This car comes equipped with air suspension. When opening the doors, car lowers about 3 cm, but even 18 cm ground clearance is quite a lot. And in the off-road setting, the ground clearance increases to almost 30 centimeters, so be careful not to fall out. The Defender cockpit is very well laid out. There are large door pockets, there is an easy-to-read instrument cluster. This is a virtual display, virtual instruments, but there is a classic theme on this, and I appreciate this very much. This one has a larger PIVO Pro infotainment system display. It's easy to use the system, it's easy to read. There's a lot of off-road information, which is very useful. Now, on the passenger side is a big, long storage space with a USB-C port, and underneath is a small glove box. On the center console are physical buttons and knobs for AC and drive modes. Further down are the cup holders, the wireless charger, some more USB ports somewhere down here, and the armrest storage is a fridge here. It's an option on most cars, but in this one, the limited edition, it's standard. And it's a good thing to have, even though it's pretty cold outside today. And now let's look at the back seat. When thinking about getting the Defender, we wanted the 90. Everybody bought the 110 and we wanted to stand out. There's a surprising amount of space in the rear of the Defender 90. At the time, we didn't consider how our aging parents and aunts would get in the back. We're the designated pensioner cabbies, you know. Anyway, there's plenty of legroom and headroom in the back. The seat is wide. Getting in may be problematic, though, especially for adults. Even with the front seat slid all the way forward, the door opening is narrow and there is a high step to climb. Now, the back seat is quite low above the floor, so even my thighs are in the air. In the long run, taller passengers may find it uncomfortable. Also, I wouldn't mind if the backrest angle was adjustable, as the current position is um, too relaxed, in my opinion. Good thing there's third zone climate control and heated seats. As for USB ports, it looks as if Land Rover ordered too many USB-A outlets, and while they swapped one USB-A for a USB-C in the front, two USB-A ports remain in the back. And now let's move on to the boot, which was the deal breaker for me, but it also saved me from trading both my kidneys for a Defender. You win some, you lose some. The boot capacity in the short wheelbase Defender is just under 300 liters to the window line, and that's not much more than in a Toyota Yaris. The worst part is that the boot is very shallow, so my gear case doesn't fit flat. Seriously, the door doesn't close. So putting it upright doesn't fix anything because I need to have access to my gear when I'm working. Also, what about luggage if we go to a faraway filming location? Access to the rear seats is difficult, and also I don't want to throw potentially dirty luggage on the rear seat, right? Of course, you can fold down the backrest in the second row, but some beautiful mind designed the interior so that the rear seats in the Defender 90 don't fold flat, and you have to get over a 10 cm hump marked by an aluminum rail. Anyway, this is what it looks like when I packed my gear case and the tripods. I don't understand why the designers decided to go for more legroom in the back, even though the rear seat will be used sporadically, rather than make the boot usable for more than an overnight trip. 
prices for the non-commercial Land Rover Defender 90 start at €61,900. The limited 75th anniversary edition starts at €111,000 for the P400. And with options, this test car costs about €114,000. And so, in order to film the Land Rover Defender 90, I had to bring my gear in my Mini Countryman. Ironic, because I still love the short wheelbase Defender and I wish I had a hundred grand lying around to buy another car to use on certain occasions. There is nothing left to do but to get back to work. This is how dreams are realized, which I hope is also the case for you. And how do you like the Land Rover Defender 90? What do you think about the color, the Grasmere Green, now that you know its significance? And what cars are on your dream list? Let me know in the comment section below. If you like my sarcastic, down-to-earth and possibly mildly amusing car reviews, join me every Friday at 3 p.m. Central European time. And don't forget to subscribe and like this video as it helps me with the YouTube algorithm. Thanks for watching and I will see you in the next one.